Today, we acknowledge our God and Saviour, Jesus Christ. We acknowledge you, Lord, because you are the creator, the provider and the supreme owner of all things. We also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we work and live and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community. We pay our respect to elders past present and emerging and pray that we can work together to leave a legacy of reconciliation, justice and hope for all future Australians. Well, good morning. It is Lauren here with you from the Bendigo Salvation Army today and we're looking forward to sharing with you today a message of salvation as Andrew Walker brings the message to us. Um, But before we do, what a week it has been. There's a lot of uncertainty happening at the moment, but it's great for me to know that I can find certainty and hope in Jesus, and I hope that you're able to find that as well. Well, as Andrew brings a message today, um, I want to bring a song to you first. Um, Have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? And it says, have you been to Jesus for the cleansing power? Are you washed in the blood of the lamb? Are you fully trusting in his grace this hour? Are you washed in the blood of the lamb? And it talks about the soul cleansing blood of Jesus that washes us white as snow. Here's this song this morning. Romans chapter 3, verses 21 to 26. Romans chapter 3, verse 21 to 26. But now God has shown us a way to be made right with him without keeping the requirements of the law, as was promised in the writings of Moses and the prophets long ago. We are made right with God by placing our faith in Jesus Christ. And this is true for everyone who believes no matter who we are. For everyone has sinned. We all fall short of God's glorious standard. Yet God, in his grace, freely makes us right in his sight. He did this through Christ Jesus when he freed us from the penalty for our sins. For God presented Jesus as the sacrifice for sin. People are made right with God when they believe that Jesus sacrificed his life shedding his blood. This sacrifice shows that God was being fair when he held back and did not punish those who sinned in times past. For he was looking ahead and including them in what he would do in this present time. God did this to demonstrate his righteousness 
for he himself is fair and just and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. May God add his blessing uh, to those words today. For a moment I just want you to close your eyes and I want you to go on an imaginary journey with me. So I want you to imagine what will your life look like in one year from now? It's hard to know what we can even do next week, isn't it, let alone in a year? But what do you think your life will be like in a year from now? Now I want you to stretch your brain a little further and what about five years from now? What about 20 years from now? Well, my back, back starting to ache at the thought. 50 years from now. I'll be nearly ready to get a letter from the Queen. What about 100 years from now? The scary thing as we do that exercise is at some point you go, oh, my life won't be on this earth anymore by that point unless some, some amazing thing happens. In 100 years' time, I'll be 147, I think. But I tell you what, I don't know if I've got 100 years left in my back <laughs> or in my legs or in my... Yes, the, the body ages. Um, but it's a reality we all have to face that one day we're going to each die. And it's not an easy reality to face at times. And it's one of the things I think the world as a whole is grappling with at the moment, with this pandemic sweeping through and 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 then there's always the question of how much worth is a is one life and, and all this sort of thing of course every life is valuable and important but it does when we're faced with this in the news every day it's putting our own mortality into our our faces um constantly and one thing i found one of the things i don't know if i'd call it a joy but one of the things we get to do in in this sort of a role as a minister is funerals um, I must say I prefer funerals to weddings because weddings they record it and people remember everything you say but at a funeral generally people are too upset so they don't remember you could say anything and they won't remember what you say so there's less pressure but I often find that people don't even think about this question of death until they're suddenly faced with it at a funeral and even then you can tell that a lot of people don't even really want to think about it. They don't want to, to comprehend it. And then they start trying to work out, you know, especially if they're people of, you know, we do, in the Salvation Army, we get to do a lot of funerals for people that aren't of faith and the families or the families aren't of faith. And, and they'll say things like, oh, at least they're in a better place now or they're, not, they're free from suffering. They'll sort of say these little, and we've probably all said them ourselves, um, but these, these are said without really any thought. And if, not that I'd do it while someone's grieving, but if I was to really drill down and say, what do you mean when you say that, that they're in a better place? What do you mean by a better place? I'm sure they wouldn't have any real, anything more than just that sentence. They've never really thought about it. Is there a God? Does God exist? I bet you're hoping I don't say no. <laughs> I believe God exists, I believe God exists but there's a lot of people out there that say you're just believing in a fairy tale if you believe in God but the interesting thing is it's impossible to 100% prove God exists but it's also 100% impossible to prove God doesn't exist and whatever your belief is whether you believe in God or not it takes faith to have that belief an atheist has to have as much belief in their point of view as a full-on Christian does in their point of view because the reality is now I know it, probably each of you in the room or anyone that's listening online probably has had experiences of God and you know within your heart that God is real but you can't physically say here's, here's God let me introduce you to him here's the physical embodiment of God that's the first thing we have to realize is whatever we think about God and life after death, it takes faith, it takes belief. Now the reality is, is when it comes to this question, is there life after death? It's almost like there's, it's innate within people. People have this innate sense that there is life after death. 
if you look at cultures right throughout history, they've got some sort of a, a concept of an afterlife. Um, going right back to the earliest form of humanity, right through today, there's this, this concept of the, there is some sort of life after death. It's actually only a fairly recent thing where people don't believe in life after death. So if we believe that there's a life after death, and most Australians would say, yes, there is, even if they don't believe in God, they would say there's, there's some sort of life after death. It brings us to this question, is there a heaven? Is there a heaven? The cheesecake shop, when I walk in there, I think, oh, if heaven's half as good as this, then it'll be pretty good. But heaven's even going to be uh, greater than that. You see, Jesus says in John 10.10 10, that the thief's purpose is to steal and kill and destroy, but his purpose, Jesus' purpose, is to give them a rich and satisfying life. Jesus came to give us life and life in all its fullness. Not just full life on this earth, but full life for all eternity. We as human beings hate bad things. We don't like it. We don't like it when someone's mean to us. We don't like it when someone hurts us. We don't like it when we get sick. We don't like it when we stub our toe. We don't like our bodies aging. We don't like the thing, a lot of the things in this world. And we look forward to, won't it be great one day when we're free of all that? You know, people say at least they're free from pain. They're f- we, we look forward to this place where there's perfection, where there's only good, there's no evil. There's no pain, there's no suffering. As, as it says in Revelation, there's no more crying or mourning or pain for the old order of things has passed away. But this is then when we hit a problem. If we believe there's a heaven and that it's a perfect place, the problem then starts to come back onto us. If we were to look in the mirror, how do you go in the perfection stakes? Are you Instagram worthy? Is your life Instagram worthy? See, our problem is sin. Now, often we equate sin equals badness. You know, sin is doing a bad thing, like sin is kicking someone in the shins because you don't like them, or, or sin is um, whacking them on the head, or, or sin is doing bad. But sin is not so much more than, than being bad. And I think we sometimes make the mistake in the church of saying the sin is but only equals badness because a lot of people in the world go well I'm generally pretty good you know I don't I don't I don't intentionally hurt anybody I try to do my best sometimes I hurt people because you know I might be tired or just something slips out or whatever but sin is more than just being bad sin is really in its essence is selfishness sin is in essence we want our way rather than God's way we want what's best for us rather than what's best for everyone else or best for God and this is a desire that we have within us from birth when a baby's born what's the first thing they do hopefully they cry because they're wanting attention they're needing attention it's like it's a survival instinct I need food I need air I need the things that will keep me alive and that sticks with us right through our whole life and and even when we come to faith we still have this desire within us You know, we see someone in need and we think, I've got to help that person, but then something says within us, but that's not what's best for you. Why don't, wouldn't you rather be watching Netflix or something like that? This this idea of sin is this, this thing within us that's constantly trying to pull us away from the good doing good for God, doing good for others, to put to towards our own desires, our own wants. And yes, sometimes those things can end up in very bad things, you know, like this person's annoying me, so I'm going to kill them. Or I want what that person wants, so I'm going to steal it. You know, that's selfishness in its ultimate form. But, but selfishness happens in so many ways. It's like, you know, when we, we should be listening to someone, but we can't be bothered because we're tired. Or someone doesn't quite do what we want, so we start thinking um, judgmental thoughts about them. Sin is about us wanting our own way. And when you go back to Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, God said they could eat of any fruit but except the one fruit from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And of course then they start going, oh, I want that. I want that. 
Isaiah 59 2 says it's your sins that have cut you off from God because of your sins he has turned away and will not listen anymore and this is the problem when it comes to that to this idea of perfection not one of us in this room not one of us in the world is perfect I heard one someone say once I'm not perfect I'm sure I'll find out one one, one day when I make a mistake but the reality is is no one of us is perfect and so when we when we think about a God who is perfect and we think about heaven that is perfect as soon as any of us go there we're going to wreck the place have you ever walked into your house thinking your shoes were clean and suddenly discovered they were dirty but you've already gone through a couple of rooms before you turn around and realize anyone ever done that i've done that it's an annoying thing because then you have to spend the next 10 15 minutes cleaning up your mess um, that's what we'd do to heaven if we were to go in in our current states we'd leave a mess we'd we'd destroy heaven imagine that being known andrew the destroyer of heaven we'll put your own name in there that's where we have a problem with sin and it separates us from god it separates us from what god created us to be romans 3 23 tells us that no one is good enough for everyone has sinned we all fall short of god's glorious standard so it's, sin is not about being bad it's being sin is about not being perfect you can be the most perfect person in the world but if you're just 0.001 percent off perfection you're not good enough for heaven and I don't think there's anyone alive that's even got that close. We're not good enough. We're, we fall short of God's glorious standard. And so when you look at most religions in the world, they work on this idea of, of self-improvement, of trying to become the best you can. In some religions, the, the way to do that is to go off on your own and, and to live almost a, a hermit-type lifestyle and, and really beat your body into submission. Um, some, you know, it may be that you have to live multiple lives to finally get to that, that point of perfection. Um, in other religions, such as um, Judaism, which is where Christianity comes from, it was, you, you reached this perfection through sacrificing. So you took all your bad stuff and then you'd sacrifice a lamb or, or some sort of animal and you'd, effectively you'd, be, you'd put your hands on the animal and your sin would go from you onto the animal and die with the animal um, i'm glad we don't do sacrifices today in the christian church because i'd be passing out every time every church service having to, to to sacrifice the animal we're not good enough but in christianity we say we don't believe we can earn our way into heaven we can't we can't ever get ourselves good enough we can't work on a philosophy or whatever it is we can't get ourselves into heaven through our works we also would say that going home and killing your family cat's not going to get you there either. So what's the answer for us? Well, we would say the answer is Jesus. We may not be good enough, but Jesus is. Romans 6.23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord jesus death and resurrection it's why you go into any christian church you'll see a cross is because the cross reminds us that it's only through jesus death and resurrection that we can receive the gift of eternal life first timothy 2 5 says for there is one god and one mediator who can reconcile god and humanity the man his name's christ jesus it's through jesus death and resurrection it's through his he became the ultimate sacrifice so as i mentioned before in judaism they would sacrifice uh, an unblemished lamb to uh, get rid of their sins and they'd put their sins onto it but you'd have to keep doing that over and over jesus became the one-time sacrifice for all because he lived a blem an unblemished life he lived the perfect life and then he gave his life willingly and took on to him all of our sin all of our imperfection but more than that he, t he takes his imperfection he takes our imperfection onto him but then he takes his perfection and puts it onto us it's like an exchange is what he did on the cross and that was only made possible not just through his death but because he again, he rose from the dead he conquered death 
So he takes our dirtiness, he takes our dirty shoes and gives us clean ones. Better than that, he takes our whole dirty life and gives us a clean life. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. But God showed his great love for us by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. God reached out and gave us Jesus. And so what this means is that we don't get into heaven because we've become perfect. We get into heaven because Jesus is perfect. And that's where it was saying back in Romans 3 that I read earlier, that it's by believing in what he did on the cross, that's what enables us to receive that gift of eternal life. But then this brings us to another question that a lot of people in the world would throw at us. Well, is Jesus real? Was Jesus real? Well, most people wouldn't argue that he was a real person. Historians would agree with that as well. He was a real person. But the real question is, well, not was Jesus real, but was Jesus really the Son of God? Did Jesus really rise from the dead? And when we talk about rising from the dead, we're not just saying coming back to life. He was resurrected, not raised to life. He was resurrected. He actually came in a new form. He received his new eternal body, you could say. People didn't recognise him, but then they did. There was something familiar about him, but something different. And if you read through his appearances after he rose from the dead, he was able to enter locked rooms without going through the door. We don't know how he did that. But he was still able to eat fish on the beach. He was able to um, have bread and wine with his followers. But when people first saw him, they didn't recognise him. Not until he either said or did something that went, oh, I know why you look familiar, you're Jesus. This can be, this is the real sticking point. Was Jesus, did he really rise from the dead? I think for me, one of the things that really spoke to me the most as I was exploring this as a teenager was that, if you, if you know the Bible, you'll know that Jesus had 12 followers. Of course, Judas Iscariot um, betrayed Jesus, but the other 11 were there um, when he died, and they, plus many others, saw Jesus when he rose from the dead. All of them, all of those 11, bar John, gave their life as a martyr, and John finished his life in imprisonment. Now, these are the people that would know if Jesus really didn't rise from the dead. They wouldn't, because they'd know it was fake. If they, if they faked it, they'd know. Now, I don't know about you, but I, I might be willing to give my life for something that I believe is real, but I wouldn't be willing to sacrifice my life for something I knew was totally fake. And you think of all those followers of Jesus, if they really knew that this was a fake, that Jesus never rose from the dead, surely at least one of them, if not all of them, would have gone, hang on, I'm not, I'm, I'm not willing to give my life for this. It's not like they were getting prestige and glory for it, they were just getting poverty and, and um, hardship and persecution. They didn't have a good life because of it. But yet they gave their life as a sacrifice because they knew Jesus had risen from the dead. We weren't there, so we, did, we, we never saw the resurrected Jesus, but these guys did, and they were willing to die for what they witnessed. So if we believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that he died and rose again so that we can be forgiven, what do we need to do to receive this gift of eternal life? Well, Romans chapter 10 verse 9 says this if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved how simple is that that's the way to heaven if you openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you, it doesn't say you might be saved or um, you'll at least get to stage two. It says you will be saved. Back in Romans chapter three and in verse 26, 
It says, God did this to demonstrate his righteousness, for he himself is fair and just, and he makes sinners right in his sight when they believe in Jesus. Simple, when you believe. Openly declare and believe in your heart. I think it's the most simple way to God that exists in the world. Openly declare Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. And when we do that, we then receive into our hearts his presence through his Holy Spirit. And that's when we then know that we know that God is real because we experience his power, his presence in our lives. We sometimes like to complicate things though, I think, in the church. And you can go to any Christian bookshop and you can read books and books and books. Go to the, the theology section and, and, you know, a lot of that work's important stuff, but it, you can get lost in it trying to explain what's simply said in one sentence here. Believe, openly declare that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. This is a great thing to know for those that aren't believers in Jesus but they want to know that they are going to be in heaven when they die. This is what you need to know. For those of us that have already done that, it's good for us to know this so that we can let others know when they ask the question. How do I get to heaven? Simple, just declare Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. Then they'll probably ask follow-up questions that might get a bit more complicated and that's why you need to know a little bit more. Um, But at the essence, this is the simplicity of the gospel. If you look at surveys, the the reality is the majority of Australians still believe in life after death. The majority of Australians, by a long margin, believe in some form of God. But when they look to the church, they don't think this is our message. They think the message of the church is, you've got to do this and this and this and this and this. They think it's a works-based thing. They think they need to be good enough. I've had so many people say, oh, I'm not good enough to go to church. Or if I go to church, the roof will cave in. This is the thoughts people have. As I, maybe you, if anyone ever says that to you, maybe your reply will, could be, well, if I went to heaven in this state, I'd be the destroyer of heaven. But thankfully, Jesus has saved me because he rose from the dead. He died and rose from the dead. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much that you reached out to us and provided a way for us to be made right with you so that we can experience fullness of life here on this earth and also eternal life with you in glory. Lord, help us to remember that it's so simple that all we need to do is to declare you a Lord and believe in our hearts that you've ris- you, ra- you were raised from the dead. Because, Lord, it's your sacrifice that makes us whole because, Lord, we, we are so imperfect with our wrinkles and warts and and sin in our life, Lord. But you're perfect and we only we desperately need your perfection. We desperately need you to clothe us with your holiness and righteousness. So Lord, again today, we ask that afresh, that you will make us right with you, that you will cleanse us that you will make us whole. Forgive us for our selfishness, forgive us for our sin, forgive us for the times we've turned our back on you and gone our own way. Forgive us, Lord, when we, for when we've hurt others through our selfishness, for when we've hurt you or even hurt ourselves through our selfishness. Forgive us, Lord, and make us whole, I pray. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And if you'd like to respond to this message today or you'd like some prayer that this message has prompted you to think about, then you can text your name through to 0409 191 
324. That's 0409 191 324. And someone will get back to you. Um, and we'd love to pray for you and and pray that you can experience life in all its fullness at the moment, at this very moment in your life. Uh, for more information on volunteering, pastoral care or emergency relief needs, you can visit the salvationarmy.org.au forward slash Bendigo online. And if you'd like to give to the Bendigo Salvos Church, then our banking details are as follows. Our account name is the Salvation Army and our BSB is 033688 and our account number is 811119. Well, I'd like to thank you for sharing with the Bendigo Salvos Church today. It's been great to have your company and we look forward to sharing with you again next Sunday. Thank you.